This recording is a product of Audio Anarchy. The Anatomy of Fascism by Robert O. Paxton. Chapter 5 Exercising Power. The Nature of Fascist Rule. Dual State and Dynamic Shapelessness. Fascist propagandists wanted us to see the leader alone on his pinnacle, and they had remarkable success. Their image of monolithic power was later reinforced by the Allies' wartime awe of the Nazi juggernaut, as well as by post-war claims by German and Italian conservative elites that they had been the fascists' victims rather than their accomplices. It lingers on today in most people's idea of fascist rule. Perspicacious observers soon perceived, however, that fascist dictatorships were neither monolithic nor static. No dictator rules by himself. He must obtain the cooperation or at least the acquiescence of the decisive agencies of rule, the military, the police, the judiciary, senior civil servants, and of powerful social and economic forces. In the special case of fascism, having depended upon conservative elites to open the gates to him, the new leaders could not shunt them casually aside. Some degree, at least, of obligatory power-sharing with the pre-existing conservative establishment made fascist dictatorships fundamentally different in their origins, development, and practice from that of Stalin. Consequently, we have never known an ideologically pure fascist regime. Indeed, the thing hardly seems possible. Each generation of scholars of fascism has noted that the regimes rested upon some kind of pact or alliance between the fascist party and powerful conservative forces. In the early 1940s, the social democratic refugee Franz Neumann argued in his classic Behemoth that a cartel of party, industry, army, and bureaucracy ruled Nazi Germany, held together only by, quote, profit, power, prestige, and especially fear, unquote. At the end of the 1960s, the moderate liberal Karl Dietrich Brocker found that, quote, National Socialism came into being and into power under conditions that permitted an alliance between conservative authoritarian and technicistic, nationalistic, and revolutionary dictatorial forces, unquote. Martin Brozat referred to the conservatives and nationalists in Hitler's cabinet as his, quote, coalition partners, unquote. In the late 1970s, Hans Mommsen described the National Socialist governing system as an alliance between, quote, ascending fascist elites and members of traditional leadership groups interlocked despite differences, unquote, in a common project to set aside parliamentary government, re-establish strong government, and crush, quote, Marxism, unquote. The composite nature of fascist rule in Italy was even more flagrant. The historian Gaetano Salvamini, home from exile, recalled the, quote, dualistic dictatorship, unquote, of Duce and King. Alberto Acquaroni, the preeminent scholar of the fascist state, emphasized the, quote, centrifugal forces, unquote, and, quote, tensions, unquote, Mussolini confronted in a regime that still, quote, 15 years after the march on Rome, unquote, had, quote, many features derived directly from the liberal state, unquote. The prominent German scholars of Italian fascism, Wolfgang Schieder and Jens Peterson, speak of, quote, opposing forces and counterweights, unquote and Massimo Lignani of the, quote, conditions of cohabitation cooperation, unquote, among the regime's components. Even Emilio Gentile, 
most eager to demonstrate the power and success of the totalitarian impulse in fascist Italy, concedes that the regime was a, quote, composite, unquote, reality, in which Mussolini's, quote, ambition of personal power, unquote, struggled in, quote, constant tension, unquote, with both, quote, traditional forces and fascist party intransigence, unquote themselves divided by, quote, muffled conflict, unquote, sorda lotta, among factions. Composite makeup also means that fascist regimes have not been static. It is a mistake to suppose that once the leader reached power, history ended and was replaced by pageantry. On the contrary, The history of the fascist regimes we have known has been filled with conflict and tension. The conflicts we have already observed at the stage of taking root sharpen when the moment arrives to distribute the spoils of office and to choose among courses of action. The stakes grow as policy differences play into tangible gains and losses. Conservatives tend to pull back toward a more cautious traditional authoritarianism, respectful of property and social hierarchy. Fascists pull forward toward dynamic, leveling, populist dictatorship prepared to subordinate every private interest to the imperatives of national aggrandizement and purification. Traditional elites try to retain strategic positions, The parties want to fill them with new men or bypass conservative power bases with, quote, parallel structures, unquote. The leaders resist challenges from both elites and party zealots. These struggles waxed and waned in Italy and Germany with varying outcomes. While the Italian fascist regime decayed toward conservative authoritarian rule, Nazi Germany radicalized toward unbridled party license. But fascist regimes have never been static. We must see fascist rule as a never-ending struggle for preeminence within a coalition exacerbated by the collapse of constitutional restraints and the rule of law and by a prevailing climate of social Darwinism. Some commentators have reduced this struggle to a conflict between party and state. One of the earliest and most suggestive interpretations of party-state conflict was the refugee scholar Ernst Frankel's portrayal of Nazi Germany as a dual state. In Hitler's regime, Frankel wrote, a, quote, normative state, unquote, composed of the legally constituted authorities and the traditional civil service, jostled for power with a, quote, prerogative state, unquote, formed by the party's parallel organizations. Frankel's perception was a fruitful one, and I will draw on it. According to Frankel's model of Nazi governance, the normative segment of a fascist regime continued to apply the law according to due process, and officials in that sector were recruited and promoted according to bureaucratic norms of competence and seniority. In the prerogative sector, by contrast, No rules applied except the whim of the ruler, the gratification of party militants, and the supposed destiny of the Volk, the Raza, or other, quote, chosen people, unquote. The normative state and the prerogative state coexisted in conflict-ridden, but more or less workmanlike cooperation, giving the regime its bizarre mixture of legalism and arbitrary violence. Hitler never formally abolished the constitution drafted in 1919 for the Weimar Republic and never totally dismantled the normative state in Germany, though he himself refused to be bound by it, refusing, for example, to have a euthanasia law drafted for fear of having his hands tied by rules and bureaucracy. 
After the Reichstag fire, as we saw in the last chapter, Hitler was given the authority to set aside any existing law or right as needed to cope with a perceived national emergency of Marxist terror. After spring 1933, unlimited police and judicial repression were permissible in Germany if national security seemed to demand it, despite the continued existence of a normative state. Over time, the Nazi prerogative state steadily encroached upon the normative state and contaminated its work, so that even within it, the perception of national emergency allowed the regime to override individual rights and due process. After the war began, the Nazi prerogative state achieved something approaching total dominance. Normative institutions atrophied at home and functioned hardly at all in the occupied territories of former Poland and the Soviet Union, as we shall see more fully in the next chapter. Fascist Italy can also be fruitfully interpreted as a dual state, as we already know. Mussolini, however, accorded far more power to the normative state than Hitler did. Fascist propaganda put the state, not the party, at the center of its message. We are not quite sure why Mussolini subordinated his party to the state, but there are several possible explanations. He had less leeway, less drive, and less luck than Hitler. President Hindenburg died in August 1934, leaving Hitler alone at the helm. Mussolini was burdened with King Victor Emmanuel III to the end, and it was the king who eventually deposed him in July 1943. Mussolini may also have feared the rivalry of his freewheeling party chieftains. Even so, the Italian fascist state contained important prerogative elements. Its secret police, the OVRA, its controlled press, its economic baronies, the IRI, for example, and its African fiefdoms, where party chiefs like Italo Balbo could strut and command the life and death of indigenous peoples. And in the late 1930s, involvement in war strengthened the Italian prerogative state. The struggle for dominance within fascist dictatorships involves more than party and state, however, or prerogative and normative states. Frankel's dual state image is incomplete. Elements outside the state also participate in the tug of war for power within fascist regimes. The German and Italian fascist regimes replaced with their own organizations traditionally independent power centers, such as labor unions, youth clubs, and associations of professions and producers. The Nazis even attempted to impose a German Christian bishop and doctrine on the Protestant churches. Fascist regimes could not always succeed in swallowing up civil society, however. Karl Friedrich and Zbigniew Brzezinski, the founding scholars of the totalitarian model, coined the term, quote, islands of separateness, unquote, to describe elements of civil society that survive within a totalitarian dictatorship. Such islands of separateness as Catholic parishes, however little inclined they might be to oppose the regime fundamentally beyond objecting to specific actions, could possess sufficient organizational resiliency and emotional loyalty to withstand party infiltration, one does not have to accept the totalitarian model integrally to find the islands of separateness metaphor useful. Hitler and the Nazi party gradually overcame most of the islands of separateness within the German state and society in a process called, euphemistically by party propagandists, Gleichaltung, coordination or leveling. A common oversimplification makes this process seem both inevitable, and unilinear. Well-rooted economic and social associations could not be swept away so casually, however, even in Nazi Germany. Gleichaltung could involve two-way negotiation, as well as force. 
Some groups and organizations were able to subvert Nazi institutions from within or appropriate them for their own aims. Others quietly but stubbornly defended partial autonomy, even while accepting some of the regime's aims. German citizens could turn even the dread Gestapo to their own personal ends by denouncing a rival, a creditor, a parent, or an unsatisfactory spouse to the secret police. Fraternities in German universities are a good example of survival. Nazism was so attractive to students that even before 1933, their national organization had been taken over by party activists. One would therefore have expected fraternities to disappear into Gleischeltung without a murmur after January 1933. Despite the Nazi regime's efforts to transform the reactionary dueling clubs into party Kameradschaffen, social and training centers, however, fraternities persisted unofficially, partly because powerful Nazi officials among the old boy networks and alumni associations defended them, partly because students grew increasingly apathetic toward party propaganda. In the much slower process of consolidating fascist rule in Italy, only the labor unions, the political parties, and the media were fully, quote, brought into line, unquote. The Catholic Church was the most important island of separateness in fascist Italy, and although the regime encroached briefly in 1931 on the church's youth movements and schools, it ultimately lost that battle. The Italian fascist student clubs, the Gruppi Universitaria Fascista, GUF, were quietly appropriated by their members for their own extra-fascist or even anti-fascist enjoyment, as was the leisure time organization, the Dopolavoro. All these enduring tensions within fascist regimes pitted against each other four elements that together forged these dictatorships out of their quarrelsome collaboration. The fascist leader, his party, whose militants clamored for jobs, perquisites, expansionist adventures, and the fulfillment of some elements of their early radical program. The state apparatus, functionaries such as police and military commanders, magistrates, and local governors. And finally, civil society, holders of social, economic, political, and cultural power, such as professional associations, leaders of big business and big agriculture, churches, and conservative political leaders. This four-way tension gave these regimes their characteristic blend of febrile activism and shapelessness. Tension was permanent within fascist regimes because none of the contending groups could dispense completely with the others. Conservatives hesitated to get rid of the fascist leader for fear of letting the left or the liberals regain power. Hitler and Mussolini, for their part, needed the economic and military resources that the conservatives controlled. At the same time, the dictators could not afford to weaken their obstreperous parties too much, lest they undermine their own independent power base. No contender could destroy the others outright, for fear of upsetting the balance of forces that kept the tandem in power and the left at bay. In their protracted struggles for supremacy within fascist rule, the parallel organizations that fascist parties developed during the period of taking root played complex and ambiguous roles. They were an asset for a fascist leader who wished to outflank the conservative bastions instead of attacking them frontally. At the same time, however, they offered ambitious radical militants an autonomous power base to challenge the leader's preeminence. In Italy, the fascist party at first duplicated every level of public authority with a party agency. The local party chief flanked the appointed mayor, Bodesta. The regional party secretary, Federale, flanked the prefect. The fascist militia flanked the army, and so on. 
As soon as his power was consolidated, however, Mussolini declared that the revolution is over, unquote, and explicitly made the prefect, quote, the highest authority of the state, unquote, to whom party leaders were subordinated. The Duce had no intention of letting the Raz push him around again. Italian fascism's most successful parallel organization did not challenge the state, but invaded the realm of leisure time recreation, an area heretofore left to individual choice, private clubs, or Catholic parishes. In practice, the fascist Dobolovaro fell far short of its announced aims of building the nation and creating the fascist new man and woman. It was substantially appropriated from within by ordinary Italians who just wanted to see movies or play sports. It was, nonetheless, the fascist regime's most ambitious attempt to penetrate Italian society down to the country towns and compete with the local boss and the priest for social authority there. The Nazi party competed with traditional agencies by a similar array of parallel organizations. The party had its own paramilitary force, the SA, its own party court, party police, and youth movement, the party's foreign policy branch, first under Alfred Rosenberg, but later part of Joachim von Ribbentrop's personal staff, the Deinstell Ribbentrop, intervened actively among German-speaking foreign populations in Austria and the Czech Sudetenland. After the Nazi party attained power, the parallel organizations threatened to usurp the functions of the army, the foreign office, and other agencies. In a separate and sinister development, the political police was detached from the interior ministries of the German states and centralized, step by step, as the notorious Gestapo, Geheim Staatspolizei, under the command of fanatical Nazi Heinrich Himmler. Duplication of traditional power centers by parallel party organizations was a principal reason for the already noted shapelessness and the chaotic lines of authority that characterized fascist rule and set it apart from military dictatorship or authoritarian rule. In a further complication, Fascist regimes allowed opportunists to flood into the parties, which thereby ceased to be the private clubs of old fighters. The Italian Partito Nazionale Fascista, PNF, opened its roles in 1933 in an effort to fascistize the whole population. Thereafter, party membership was required for civil service jobs, including teaching. Mussolini hoped that party membership would fortify the casual Italian civic spirit that so annoyed him, but the opposite seems to have happened. As party membership became a good career move, cynics said that the initials PNF stood for, quote, per necessita familiari, unquote. Nazi party membership, ballooned by 1.6 million between January and May 1933, even though party roles were then closed to preserve the party's identity as a select elite, many opportunist officials were given dispensations to join. In the endless contest for predominance within fascist regimes, the fascist leader sometimes managed to subject his allies to unwanted policies, as Hitler did to a significant degree. In other cases, conservative forces and bureaucrats might retain substantial independent power, as they did in fascist Italy, enough to persuade the atheist Mussolini to give the Catholic Church its most favorable treatment since Italian unification, to force him to sacrifice his syndicalist friends to businessmen's desires for autonomy and privilege, and ultimately to remove him from power in July 1943, when the approach of Allied armies convinced them that fascism was no longer serving national ends. Even Hitler, However easily he seemed to override many conservative preferences, 
never freed himself until the war became total in 1942 from the need to placate owners of munitions plants, army officers, professional experts, and religious leaders, and even public opinion. Nevertheless, fascist leaders enjoyed a kind of supremacy that was not quite like leadership in other kinds of regime. The Führer and the Duce could claim legitimacy neither by election nor conquest. It rested on charisma, a mysterious direct communication with the Volk or Raza that needs no mediation by priests or party chieftains. Their charisma resembled media-era celebrity stardom, raised to a higher power by its say over war and death. It rested on a claim to a unique and mystical status as the incarnation of the people's will and the bearer of the people's destiny. A whiff of charisma is not unknown among traditional dictators, of course, and even some democratically elected leaders, such as Churchill de Gaulle and the two Roosevelts, had it. Stalin surely had charisma, as the public hysteria at his funeral showed, but Stalin shared his role as the bearer of historical destiny with the Communist Party, which made succession possible, even if palace intrigues and murders multiplied before the successor could emerge. But fascist rule is more nakedly dependent on charisma than any other kind, which may help explain why no fascist regime has so far managed to pass power to a successor. Both Hitler and Mussolini had charisma, though Mussolini's declining vitality in middle age and his tawdry end made most people forget the magnetism he had once exhorted, even outside Italy. Charisma helps us understand several curious features of fascist leadership. The notorious indolence of Hitler, far from making Nazism more tepid, freed his subordinates to compete in driving the regime toward ever more extreme radicalization. A charismatic leader is also immune from the surprisingly widespread grumbling against the administration that quickly arose in both Germany and Italy. At the same time, charismatic leadership is brittle. It promises to the Volk or the Raza, as Adrian Littleton once noted, quote, a privileged relation with history, unquote. Having raised expectations so high, a fascist leader unable to deliver the promised triumphs risks losing his magic even faster than an elected president or prime minister of whom less is expected. Mussolini discovered this rule to his sorrow in July 1943. Studying the fascist exercise of power, therefore, is not simply a matter of laying out the dictator's will, as the propagandists claimed, and as unreflective intentionalists seem to believe. It means examining the never-ending tensions within fascist regimes among the leader, his party, the state, and traditional holders of social, economic, political, or cultural power. This reality has produced an influential interpretation of fascist governance as polyocracy, or rule by multiple, relatively autonomous power centers in unending rivalry and tension with each other. In polyocracy, the famous leadership principle cascades down through the social and political pyramid, creating a host of petty Führers and Duches in a state of Hobbesian war of all against all. This effort to understand the complex character of fascist dictatorship and its interaction with society, entirely worthy in itself, entails two risks. It makes it hard to account for the demonic energy unleashed by fascism. Why did polyocracy not simply tie everyone's hands in stalemate? Furthermore, in extreme versions, it may make us lose sight of the leader's supremacy— 
In an energetic debate in the 1980s, intentionalists defended the centrality of the dictator's will while structuralists or functionalists asserted that the dictator's will could not be applied without multiple links with state and society. Both views were easy to caricature and were sometimes taken to extremes. Intentionalism worked best for foreign and military policy, where Hitler and Mussolini both played hands-on roles. The most emotionally charged issue within the intentionalist-structuralist debate was the Holocaust, where the enormity of the outcome seemed to demand the presence of a correspondingly enormous criminal will. I will look at this issue more closely in the next chapter. A major problem for intentionalists was Hitler's personal style of rule. While Mussolini toiled long hours at his desk, Hitler continued to indulge in the lazy, bohemian dilettantism of his art student days. When aides sought his attention for urgent matters, Hitler was often inaccessible. He spent much time at his Bavarian retreat. Even in Berlin, he often neglected pressing business. He subjected his dinner guests to midnight monologues, rose at midday, and devoted his afternoons to personal passions, such as plans by his young protege, Albert Speer, to reconstruct his hometown of Linz and the center of Berlin in a monumental style befitting the thousand-year Reich. After February 1938, the cabinet ceased to meet. Some cabinet ministers never managed to see the Fuhrer at all. Hans Mommsen went so far as to call him a, quote, weak dictator, unquote. Mommsen never meant to deny the unlimited nature of Hitler's vaguely defined and haphazardly exercised power, but he observed that the Nazi regime was not organized on rational principles of bureaucratic efficiency and that its astonishing burst of murderous energy was not produced by Hitler's diligence. I will consider further the mystery of fascist radicalization in Chapter 6. Neither an extreme intentionalist view of the all-powerful leader ruling alone, nor an extreme structuralist view that initiatives from below are the main motor of fascist dynamism is tenable. In the 1990s, the most convincing work established two-way explanations in which competition among mid-level officials to anticipate the leader's intimate wishes and work toward them are given due place, while the leader's role in establishing goals and removing limits and rewarding zealous associates plays its indispensable role. The Tug of War Between Fascists and Conservatives When Adolf Hitler became Chancellor of Germany on January 30, 1933, his conservative allies, headed by Deputy Chancellor Franz von Papen, along with those conservative and nationalist leaders who supported von Papen's Hitler experiment, expected to manage the untrained new head of government without difficulty. They were confident that their university degrees, experience in public affairs, and worldly polish would give them easy superiority over the uncouth Nazis. Chancellor Hitler would spellbind the crowds, they imagined, while Deputy Chancellor von Papen ran the state. Hitler's conservative allies were not the only ones to suppose that Nazism was a flash in the pan. The Communist International was certain that the German swing to the right under Hitler would produce a counterswing to the left as soon as German workers understood that democracy was an illusion and turned away from the reformist Social Democrats. Quote, the current calm after the victory of fascism is only temporary. Inevitably, despite fascist terrorism, the revolutionary tide in Germany will grow. The establishment of open fascist dictatorship, which is destroying all democratic illusions among the masses and is freeing them from the influence of the Social Democrats, will speed up Germany's progress toward the proletarian revolution." Unquote. Against the expectations of both right and left, Hitler quickly established full personal authority. The first period of Nazi rule saw the Gleichaltung, the bringing into line not only of political enemies, but also of conservative colleagues. 
The keys to Hitler's success were his superior audacity, drive, and tactical agility, his skillful manipulation, as we saw in the previous chapter, of the idea that imminent communist terror justified the suspension of due process and the rule of law, and a willingness to commit murder. Hitler's dominance over his conservative allies had clearly been established by the early summer of 1933. By July 14th, with the law establishing a one-party state and, quote, open legal struggle against National Socialist domination was now no longer possible, unquote. Thereafter, Conservatives fought a rearguard action to defend the autonomy of their remaining centers of power from the encroachment by Nazi parties' parallel organizations. This meant defending the army from the SA, state land governments from regional party leaders, Gauleiter, the civil service and professional corps from party novices, the churches from Nazi efforts to create a German Christianity, and business concerns from SS enterprises. The conservatives' main hopes for keeping Hitler in check were President Hindenburg and Deputy Chancellor von Papen. Hindenburg's great age and failing health weakened him, however, and von Papen lacked sufficient personal drive, as well as the necessary independent administrative staff to block Nazi penetration of state agencies, especially after he had been replaced by Goering as minister-president of Prussia, the largest German state, on April 7, 1933. When von Papen attacked Nazi arbitrariness openly in a speech at the University of Marburg on June 17, 1934, the text circulated rapidly through the country. Hitler had von Papen's speechwriter, Edgar Young, arrested, banned publication of the speech, and closed down the deputy chancellor's offices. Young and other von Papen intimates were among those murdered in the Night of the Long Knives two weeks later, on June 30, 1934. The cautious and the ambitious stepped around the blood stains and went on about their business. Von Papen himself departed meekly in July to assume the relatively modest post of ambassador to Austria. The conservatives' game was up when President Hindenburg died on August 2nd. The conservatives' defensive wrigglings surfaced again in early 1938 when some of them disagreed with the pace and risk of Hitler's increasingly aggressive foreign policy. This conflict ended in February 1938 with the removal under humiliating circumstances of the commanding officers of the general staff and the army staff, Generals Blomberg and Fritsch, falsely accused of sexual improprieties. The former corporal took over the military high command, Oberkommando der Wehrmacht, OKW, in person and demanded a personal oath from his generals, like the Kaiser before him. A number of senior officers wanted to resist the army's loss of independence, but they would not act without the support of the top commanders. The subordination of the army to Hitler was even more complete than it had been to the Kaiser. Simultaneously, the foreign office was brought under party control, the career diplomat Konstantin von Neurath was removed as foreign minister on February 5, 1938, and German diplomats had the humiliation of seeing their proud corporation pass under the control of the leader of the party's parallel organization, Joachim von Ribbentrop, a man whose main international experience before 1933 had been selling German fake champagne in Britain. Under Ribbentrop, Old SA men tended to fill diplomatic posts abroad. Since Nazism's defeat in 1945, German conservatives have made much of their opposition to Hitler and of his hostility to them. As we have seen, Nazis and conservatives had authentic differences, marked by very real conservative defeats. 
At every crucial moment of decision, however, at each ratcheting up of anti-Jewish repression, at each new abridgment of civil liberties and infringement of legal norms, at each new aggressive move in foreign policy, at each further subordination of the economy to the needs of autarky and hasty rearmament, most German conservatives, with some honorable exceptions, swallowed their doubts about the Nazis in favor of their overriding common interests. Conservatives did manage to hamper one Nazi policy, the euthanasia of so-called useless persons, a matter I will discuss more fully in the next chapter. For the rest, while conservative institutions and organizations sought to safeguard their class and personal interests, they rarely challenged the regime itself. Some individual conservatives, such as those who gathered around Helmut von Moltke at his country estate in Kreisau, opposed the regime morally and intellectually and pondered about what form a new Germany should take after the war. Toward the end, when they had finally understood that Hitler was leading Germany to annihilation, some conservative senior officers and civil servants came closest to forming an effective resistance to the Nazi regime and nearly succeeding in assassinating Hitler himself on July 20th, 1944. Since Mussolini's regime failed to develop the total reach of Hitler's, it is often considered less than totalitarian. But the same elements vied for power within fascist Italy as in Nazi Germany. The leader, the party, the state, bureaucracy, and civil society. It was the outcome that differed, for power was apportioned among them in rather different ways. Distrustful of his party activists, Mussolini worked to subordinate them to an all-powerful state. At the same time, he was forced by circumstances to share the summit with the king and to placate the much stronger Catholic Church. Party activists fought back with accusations that the Duce was allowing the conservative fellow travelers, fianche giatori, literally flankers, to dilute the movement. The final result in Italy was what some have called, quote, a tougher version of liberal Italy, unquote. This view underestimates both the party's innovations in state organization and propaganda, especially in its dealings with youth and especially during the Ethiopian War. Mussolini's capacity for arbitrary action and the degree of latent tension among Duce, party, and conservative elites in the Italian version of the dual state. The tug of war between leader and party. In fascist propaganda, and in most people's image of fascist regimes, leader and party are fused into a single expression of the national will. In reality, there is permanent tension between them, too. The fascist leader inevitably neglects some early campaign promises in his quest for the alliances necessary for power and thus disappoints some of his radical followers. Mussolini had to face down both the partisans of radical squadrismo, like Ferinacci, and enthusiasts for integral syndicalism, like Edmondo Rossoni. Although Hitler always controlled his party more fully than Mussolini, even he confronted dissent many times until he drowned it in blood in June 1934. Before power, the partisans of an authentic German socialism, a third way intermediate between capitalism and Marxism, whom we have already met, created embarrassments for him with businessmen whom he wanted to court. There were also those impatient with his all-or-nothing strategy, like Walter Stennis and Gregor Strasser. As we have already seen, he did not hesitate to expel the latter two from the party. In the first days of Hitler's rule, conflict erupted over the Second Revolution, a further wave of radical change that would give the spoils of place and position to the old fighters. In the spring of 1933, party militants celebrated their arrival in power by continuing their street actions against the left, against the moderate bourgeoisie, and against the Jews. 
the boycott of Jewish businesses organized by the militant Fighting League of the Commercial Middle Class in spring 1933 was only one of the more conspicuous examples of, quote, revolution from below, unquote. Hitler, however, needed calm and order then, instead of challenges to the state's monopoly of violence, and party leaders announced, quote, the end of the revolution, unquote, in the summer of 1933. Aspirations for continued revolution still percolated within the SA, however, arousing concern in the business community. The SA's wish to become the armed force of the new regime made the army high command uneasy. Hitler settled these matters far more brutally and decisively than Mussolini in the Night of the Long Knives. The lesson was not lost on other would-be opponents. The problem for fascist regimes, a problem traditional dictators never had to face, was how to keep the party's energy boiling without troubling public order and upsetting conservative allies. Most Nazi party radicals were kept from troubling the regime by Hitler's personal control, by the regime's domestic and foreign successes, and eventually by the outlets of war and the murder of the Jews. The occupation of Western Europe provided gratifying opportunities for spoliation. Things went much further on the Eastern Front. There, the party ran amok with occupation policy, as we will see in the next chapter. Mussolini dominated his party, too, but in the face of much more open and durable challenges. The fascist party leaders, particularly the local Raz, whose exploits during the period of Squadrismo gave them a certain autonomous power, often expressed dissatisfaction with Mussolini. There were two sources of these tensions, a functional one, in that Mussolini had different responsibilities as a party leader than the local Raz and therefore saw things differently, and a personal one, in that Mussolini was more inclined to normalize relations with traditional conservatives than were some of his hot-headed followers. As we saw, Movement and leader quarreled in 1921 over the transformation of the movement into a party, and in August 1921, the Raz forced Mussolini to give up his intended pact of pacification with the socialists. After power, those divergences became even sharper. Party militants were frustrated by Mussolini's first two years of moderate coalition government in 1922 through 24. We saw in Chapter 4 how, in December 1924, party militants prodded Mussolini to end his six months of indecision after the Matteotti murder and choose the aggressive way out by establishing one-party rule. In need of strong party support as he set up his new dictatorship, Mussolini named in February 1925 the most uncompromising partisan of violent squadrismo, Roberto Ferinacci, Raz of Cremona, to be secretary of the fascist party. Farinacci's appointment looked like a signal of renewed violence against opponents, of party encroachment on the civil service, and of radical social, economic, and foreign policies. Farinacci was dismissed, however, after only a year. Renewed eruptions of violence, such as eight more killings in Florence in October 1925, quote, in front of the tourists, unquote, were intolerable, and it was revealed that Farinacci's law thesis had been plagiarized. A series of more pliable party secretaries followed who, while increasing the party's size and reach, subordinated it unquestioningly to the duce and to the state bureaucracy. In the next chapter, I will take up the continued tension between Mussolini's instinct for normalization and his periodic episodes of radicalization. The Tug of War Between Party and State Both Hitler and Mussolini had to make the machinery of the state work for them, by persuasion or by force. Party militants wanted to sweep away career bureaucrats and take all the places themselves. The leaders almost never gave in to this demand. We have already seen how Hitler sacrificed the SA to the army in June 1934, 
Similarly, Mussolini prevented the milizia from invading the professional sphere of the Italian army, except for service in the colonies. In general, the fascist and Nazi regimes had no serious difficulty establishing control over public services. They largely protected civil servants' turf from party intrusion and left their professional identity intact. Civil servants were frequently in broad sympathy with fascist regimes' biases for authority and order against parliament and the left, and they appreciated enhanced freedom from legal restraint. Eliminating Jews sometimes opened up career advancement. The police were the key agency, of course. The German police were very quickly removed from the normative state and brought under Nazi party control via the SS. Himmler, supported by Hitler against rivals and the Ministry of the Interior, which traditionally controlled the police, ascended in April 1933 from political police commander of Bavaria, where he set up the first concentration camp at Dachau, to chief of the whole German police system in June 1936. This process was facilitated by the disgruntlement many German police had felt for the Weimar Republic and its, quote, coddling of criminals, unquote, and by the regime's efforts to enhance police prestige in the eyes of the public. By 1937, the annual congratulatory Police Day had expanded from one day to seven Initially, the SA were deputized as auxiliary police in Prussia, but this practice was ended on August 2, 1933, and the police faced no further threat of dilution from party militants. They enjoyed a privileged role above the law as the final arbiters of their own form of unlimited police justice. While the German police were run more directly by Nazi party chiefs than any other traditional state agency, the Italian police remained headed by a civil servant, and their behavior was little more unprofessional or partisan than under previous governments. This is one of the most profound differences between the Nazi and fascist regimes. The head of the Italian police for most of the fascist period was the professional civil servant Arturo Boccini. There was a political police, the OVRA, but the regime executed relatively few political enemies. Another crucial instrument of rule was the judiciary. Although very few judges were Nazi party members in 1933, the German magistracy was already overwhelmingly conservative. It had established a solid track record of harsher penalties against communists than against Nazis during the 1920s in exchange for a relatively limited invasion of their professional sphere by the party's special courts and people's court, the judges willingly submerged their associations in a Nazi organization and happily accepted the powerful role the new regime gave them. The Italian judiciary was little changed, since political interference had already been the norm under the liberal monarchy. Italian judges felt general sympathy for the fascist regime's commitment to public order and national grandeur. Medical professionals, not strictly part of the state but essential to the regime's smooth functioning, cooperated with the Nazi regime with surprising alacrity. The Nazis' determination to improve the biological purity of the race Italian culture was quite different on this point, contained a public health component that gratified many medical professionals. For a long time, the cruel experiments performed on prisoners by Dr. Joseph Mengele gave a distorted impression of Nazi medicine. Nazi medicine was not mere sadism, though it did cause much suffering. It embarked on extensive basic public health research. German scientists were the first to link smoking and asbestos conclusively with cancer, for example. Improving the race also meant encouraging large families, and fascist regimes were particularly active in the development of demographic science in the service of pronatalism. We will see in the next chapter how in Germany, Under the pressure of war, improving the race turned into the sterilization of the unfit and the elimination of useless mouths.
the mentally and incurably ill, and from there to ethnic genocide. Nazi administrators were proud of the scientific and bureaucratic care with which they approached these matters, so unlike the Slavs' disorderly pogroms, and they rewarded doctors and public health professionals with extensive authority over them. Many participated willingly in, quote, medicalized killing, unquote. An, quote, astonishing number, unquote, of child welfare professionals, weary of the ideological bickering between public and private and between religious and secular agencies that had nearly paralyzed this field under Weimar and already turning back toward parental authority and discipline after Weimar's experimentation, welcomed Nazism in 1933 as a new beginning. The party-state conflict was the most easily and most definitively settled of all the tensions within fascist rule. The Nazi state in particular ran vigorously right up to the end in conscious and determined rejection of any hint of the breakdown of public authority that had occurred in 1918. Accommodation, Enthusiasm, Terror the dual-state model is incomplete in yet one more crucial dimension. It leaves out public opinion. It is not enough to study the way a fascist regime exerted its authority from above. One must explore also how it interacted with its public. Did a majority of the population support fascist regimes consensually, even with enthusiasm? Or were they bent to submission by force and terror? The terror model has prevailed, partly because it serves as an alibi for the peoples concerned, but recent scholarship has tended to show that terror was selective, and that consensus was high in both Nazi Germany and fascist Italy. Neither regime was conceivable without terror. Nazi violence was omnipresent and highly visible after 1933. The concentration camps were not hidden, and executions of dissidents were meant to be known. The publicity of Nazi violence does not mean that support for the regime was coerced, however. Since the violence was directed at Jews, Marxists, and asocial outsiders, homosexuals, gypsies, pacifists, the congenitally insane or crippled, and habitual criminals, groups that many Germans were often happy to see the last of. Germans often felt more gratified than threatened by it. The rest soon learned to keep silent. Only at the end, as the Allies and the Russians closed in, when the authorities attacked anyone accused of giving in, did the Nazi regime turn its violence upon ordinary Germans. The Italian fascist pattern of violence was the opposite of the Nazi one. Mussolini spilled more blood coming to power than Hitler did, but his dictatorship was relatively mild after that. The main form of punishment for political dissidents was forced residence in remote southern hill villages. About 10,000 serious opponents of the regime were imprisoned in camps or on offshore islands. The regime sentenced to death a mere nine opponents between 1926 and 1940. But we must avoid the commonplace assumption that Mussolini's dictatorship was more comic than tragic, his order to assassinate the Rosselli brothers in France in 1937, the articulate leaders of the most important democratic resistance movement, Giustiza e Liberta, along with the notorious murder of the socialist deputy Giacomo Matteotti in June 1924, put indelible bloodstains on his regime. Fascist justice while several orders of magnitude less vicious than Nazi justice, proclaimed no less boldly the, quote, subordination of individual interests to collective interests, unquote. And one must not forget the spectacular ruthlessness of Italian colonial conquest. As with the Third Reich, fascist violence was directed selectively, against, quote, enemies of the nation, unquote. Socialists or South Slavic or African peoples who stood in the way of Italian hegemony around the Mediterranean. So it could inspire more approval than fear. 
The popularity terror dichotomy is obviously much too rigid. Even Nazism did not depend on brute force alone. One remarkable discovery of recent scholarship is how small a police apparatus sufficed to enforce its will. The Gestapo was so well supplied with denunciations from zealous or jealous citizens that it could get along with a ratio of about one police officer for 10,000 to 15,000 citizens, far fewer than the Stasi required in the post-war German Democratic Republic. The most interesting aspects of the story lie between the two extremes of coercion and popularity. It might be instructive to consider fascist regimes' management of workers, who were surely the most recalcitrant part of the population. It is clear that both fascism and Nazism enjoyed some success in this domain. According to Tim Mason, the ultimate authority on German workers under Nazism, the Third Reich contained German workers by four means. Terror, division, some concessions, and integration devices, such as the famous strength through joy, Kraft durch Freude, leisure time organization. Let there be no doubt that terror awaited workers who resisted directly. It was the cadres of the German Socialist and Communist parties who filled the first concentration camps in 1933, before the Jews. Since socialists and communists were already divided, it was not hard for the Nazis to create another division between those workers who continued to resist and those who decided to try to live normal lives. The suppression of autonomous worker organizations allowed fascist regimes to address workers individually rather than collectively. Soon, Demoralized by the defeat of their unions and parties, workers were atomized, deprived of their usual places of sociability, and afraid to confide in anyone. Both regimes made some concessions to workers. Mason's third device for worker containment. They did not simply silence them, as in traditional dictatorships. After power, official unions enjoyed a monopoly of labor representation, the Nazi labor front had to preserve its credibility by actually paying some attention to working conditions. Mindful of the 1918 revolution, the Third Reich was willing to do absolutely anything to avoid unemployment or food shortages. As the German economy heated up in rearmament, there was even some wage creep. Later in the war, the arrival of slave labor, which promoted many German workers to the status of masters, provided additional satisfactions. Mussolini was particularly proud of how workers would fare under his corporatist constitution. The Labor Charter, 1927, promised that workers and employers would sit down together in a corporation for each branch of the economy and submerge class struggle in the discovery of their common interests. It looked very imposing by 1939 when a chamber of corporations replaced Parliament. In practice, however, the corporative bodies were run by businessmen, while the workers' sections were set apart and excluded from the factory floor. Mason's fourth form of containment, integrative devices, was a specialty of fascist regimes. Fascists were past masters at manipulating group dynamics. The youth group, the leisure time association, party rallies. Peer pressure was particularly powerful in small groups. There, the patriotic majority shamed or intimidated nonconformists into at least keeping their mouths shut. Sebastian Hoffner recalled how his group of apprentice magistrates was sent in summer 1933 on a retreat where these highly educated young men, mostly non-Nazis, were bonded into a group by marching, singing, uniforms, and drill. To resist seemed pointless, certain to lead nowhere but to prison and an end to the dreamed-of career. Finally, with astonishment, he observed himself raising his arm, fitted with a swastika armband in the Nazi salute. 
These various techniques of social control were successful. Mussolini was broadly supported from 1929 at least up through his victory in Ethiopia in 1936. Accommodation with the Catholic Church was central to this support. The Lateran treaties concluded by Mussolini and Pope Pius XI in February 1929 ended nearly 60 years of conflict between the Italian state and the Vatican with mutual recognition and the payment by Italy of a substantial indemnity for its seizure of papal lands in 1870. Italy recognized Roman Catholicism as, quote, the religion of most Italians, unquote. The once anti-clerical Mussolini, who had written a youthful novel called The Cardinal's Mistress and, at 21, in a debate with a Swiss pastor, had given God, if he existed, five minutes to strike him dead, had submitted in 1925 to a belated church marriage to his longtime common-law companion, Rachele Guidi, and to the baptism of their children. In elections on March 24, 1929, the Church's explicit support helped produce a vote of 98% in favor of the fascist list of candidates, there were no others, for Parliament. Fascism paid a high price in the long term for the Church's aid to consensus. As the hair of fascist dynamism wore itself out, the tortoise of Catholic parish life and culture plodded along to become the basis of Christian democratic rule in Italy after 1945. The other ingredient of Mussolini's popularity in the middle years was his victory over Ethiopia in summer 1936, the last, it turned out, of his military successes. Popular approval of the Italian fascist regime declined only when Mussolini's expansionist foreign policy began to produce defeats. The Duce's need to demonstrate a, quote, special relation with the history, unquote, required him to mount a dynamic foreign policy. Beginning with the defeat of his volunteer armored force by Spanish Republicans and international volunteers at Guadalajara, in the hills northeast of Madrid in March 1937, however, foreign policy provided more humiliation than reinforcement for Mussolini's regime. The Nazi regime, too, aroused considerable popular enthusiasm within Germany by the mid-1930s. Full employment, plus a long string of bloodless foreign policy victories, raised approval far above the Nazis' initial 44% in the March 1933 elections. Although Germans grumbled a lot about restrictions and shortages, and although the outbreak of war in September 1939 was received glumly, the Hitler cult was exempt from the criticism reserved for party officials and bureaucrats. Fascist regimes were particularly successful with young people. Fascist arrival in power sent a shockwave down through society to each neighborhood and village. Young Italians and Germans had to face the destruction of their social organizations, if they came from socialist or communist families, as well as the attraction of new forms of sociability. The temptation to conform, to belong, and to achieve rank in the new fascist youth and leisure organizations, which I will discuss more fully below, was very powerful, especially when fascism was still new. Joining in its marching and uniformed squads was a way to declare one's independence from smothering bourgeois homes and boring parents. Some young Germans and Italians of otherwise modest attainments found satisfaction in pushing other people around. Fascism was more fully than any other political movement a declaration of youthful rebellion, though it was far more than that. Women and men could hardly be expected to react in the same way to regimes that put a high priority on restoring women to the traditional spheres of homemaking and motherhood. Some conservative women approved. The female vote for Hitler was substantial, though impossible to measure precisely, and scholars have argued sharply about whether women should be considered accomplices or victims of his regime. In the end, women escaped from the roles fascism and Nazism projected for them, less by direct resistance than simply by being themselves aided by modern consumer society. 
Jazz Age lifestyles proved more powerful than party propaganda. In fascist Italy, Edda Mussolini and other modern young women smoked and asserted an independent lifestyle like young women everywhere after World War I, while also participating in the regime's institutions. The Italian birth rate did not rise on the Duce's command. Hitler could not keep his promise to remove women from the workforce when the time came to mobilize fully for war. Intellectuals found their relationship with fascist regimes more strained than with early fascist movements. They had good reason to feel uncomfortable under the rule of former street fighters contemptuous of, quote, professors examining things behind their glasses, idiots who raise unrealistic objections to every affirmation of doctrine, unquote. All the more so since these regimes regarded the arts and sciences not as a domain of free creativity, but as a national resource subject to tight state control. Since leaders supposedly had superhuman mental powers, fascist militants preferred to settle intellectual matters by a reductio ad ducem. Fascist regimes also had the power to reward tractable and celebrated intellectuals with positions and honors. Where the regime was ready to leave a fair amount of leeway to intellectuals, as in fascist Italy, a wide range of responses was possible. Some liberal and socialist critics rejected the regime totally in the face of arrest or even death, joined soon by the untouchable liberal eminence Benedetto Croce. At the other extreme, a few authentically distinguished intellectuals like the philosopher Giovanni Gentili, the historian Giacino Volpe, and the statistician demographer Corrado Gini offered enthusiastic support. Mussolini never needed to crack down severely on cultural life because most intellectuals accepted some degree of accommodation with his regime, if only partially and occasionally. Of the signers of Croce's Manifesto of the Intellectuals of 1925, 90 could be found in 1931 writing for the very official Encyclopedia Italiano. When university professors were required to take an oath to the regime during the academic year 1931 through 32, only 11 out of 1,200 refused. Only after the racial legislation of 1938, which I will talk about more in the next chapter, did a significant number of Italian intellectuals emigrate. Intellectuals faced more intense pressure in Nazi Germany. Nazi ideologues attempted to transform thought, as in the German physics that was supposed to supplant the Jewish physics of Einstein, and the German Christianity that was supposed to purge Christian doctrine of its Jewish influences. Substantial numbers of intellectual emigrants included some non-Jews, Thomas Mann was only the most celebrated, the physicist Max Planck managed to remain active in Germany, defend some measure of independence and that of some of his colleagues, and retain the respect of the international scientific community. Still other prominent intellectuals, among them the philosopher Martin Heidegger, the sociologist Hans Freyer, and the legal scholar Carl Schmitt, found sufficient common ground with Nazism to accept official assignments. Within the range of compromise, accommodation, and quiet reticence adopted by most intellectuals, some positions remain obscure even today. Did the Nobel Prize physicist Werner Heisenberg weaken the German atomic energy program from within, as he claimed, or did it fail because of inadequate funding, changed priorities, the departure of important Jewish colleagues like Lisa Meitner, and Heisenberg's own erroneous overestimate of the amount of plutonium required to operate an atomic pile? Even if public enthusiasm was never as total as fascists promised their conservative allies, most citizens of fascist regimes accepted things as they were. The most interesting cases are people who never joined the party and who even objected to certain aspects of the regime, but who accommodated because its accomplishments overlapped with some of the things they wanted. 
while the alternatives all seemed worse. The eminent German orchestral conductor Wilhelm Furtwangler was penalized after the war for having been photographed with a beaming Hitler, but in fact, his relations with the Nazi regime were complicated. Furtwangler never joined the party. He tried in two tense face-to-face meetings to persuade the Fuhrer to relax his ban on Jewish music and musicians. He was removed from some of his conducting posts for persisting in playing the atonal music of Hindemith. But he shared the Nazis' assumptions that, quote, music arises from deep and secret forces which are rooted in the people of the nation, unquote, especially the German nation. It was unthinkable for him to leave Germany or cease his musical activity. He was indeed a privileged person under Nazism. For even though Hitler knew of Furtwangler's reservations, he also understood enough about music to realize that Furtwangler was the best conductor in Germany. By accepting accommodations of this sort, fascist regimes were able to retain the loyalty of nationalists and conservatives who did not agree with everything the party was doing. The Fascist Revolution The radical rhetoric of the early fascist movements led many observers, then and since, to suppose that once in power the fascist regimes would make sweeping and fundamental changes in the very bases of national life. In practice, although fascist regimes did indeed make some breathtaking changes, they left the distribution of property and the economic and social hierarchy largely intact, differing fundamentally from what the word revolution had usually meant since 1789. The reach of the fascist revolution was restricted by two factors. For one thing, even at their most radical, early fascist programs and rhetoric had never attacked wealth and capitalism as directly as a hasty reading might suggest. As for social hierarchy, fascism's leadership principle effectively reinforced it. Though fascists posed some threat to inherited position by advocating the replacement of the tired bourgeois elite by fascist new men. The handful of real fascist outsiders, however, went mostly into the parallel organizations. The scope of fascist change was further limited by the disappearance of many radicals during the period of taking root and coming to power. As fascist movements passed from protest and the harnessing of disparate resentments to the conquest of power, with its attendant alliances and compromises, their priorities changed, along with their functions. They became far less interested in assembling the discontented than in mobilizing and unifying national energies for national revival and aggrandizement. This obliged them to break many promises made to the socially and economically discontented during the first years of fascist recruitment. The Nazis in particular broke promises to the small peasants and artisans who had been the mainstay of their electoral following, and to favor urbanization and industrial production. Despite their frequent talk about revolution, fascists did not want a socio-economic revolution. They wanted a revolution of the soul and a revolution in the world power position of their people. They meant to unify and invigorate and empower their decadent nation to reassert the prestige of Romanita or the German Volk or Hungarism or other group destiny. For that purpose, they believed they needed armies, productive capacity, order, and property force their country's traditional productive elements into subjection, perhaps, transform them, no doubt, but not abolish them. The fascists needed the muscle of these bastions of established power to express their people's renewed unity and vitality at home and on the world stage. Fascists wanted to revolutionize their national institutions in the sense that they wanted to pervade them with energy, unity, and willpower. But they never dreamed of abolishing property or social hierarchy.
The fascist mission of national aggrandizement and purification required the most fundamental changes in the nature of citizenship and in the relation of citizens to the state since the democratic revolutions of the 18th and 19th centuries. The first giant step was to subordinate the individual to the community. Whereas the liberal state rested on a compact among its citizens to protect individual rights and freedoms, the fascist state embodied the national destiny, in service to which all the members of the national group found their highest fulfillment. We have seen that both regimes found some distinguished non-fascist intellectuals ready to support this position. In fascist states, individual rights had no autonomous existence. The state of law, the Reichstag, the état des droits, vanished, along with the principles of due process by which citizens were guaranteed equitable treatment by courts and state agencies. A suspect acquitted in a German court of law could be rearrested by agents of the regime at the courthouse door and put in a concentration camp without any further legal procedure. A fascist regime could imprison, despoil, and even kill its inhabitants at will and without limitation. All else pales before that radical transformation in the relation of citizens to public power. It follows almost as an anti-climax that fascist regimes contained no mechanisms by which citizens could choose representatives or otherwise influence policy. Parliaments lost power, elections were replaced by yes-no plebiscites and ceremonies of affirmation, and leaders were given almost unlimited dictatorial powers. Fascists claimed that the division and decline of their communities had been caused by electoral politics and especially by the left's preparations for class warfare and proletarian dictatorship. Communities so afflicted, the fascists taught, could not be unified by the play of naturally harmonious human interests, as the liberals had believed they had to be unified by state action, using persuasion and organization if possible, using force if necessary. The job required what the French sociologist Émile de Crime called, quote, mechanical solidarity, unquote, rather than, quote, organic solidarity, unquote. Fascist regimes thus contained multiple agencies for shaping and molding the citizenry into an integrated community of disciplined, hardened fighters. The fascist state was particularly attentive to the formation of youth, jealously attempting to retain a monopoly of this function, a matter that brought fascist regimes and the Catholic Church into frequent conflict. Fascist regimes set out to make the new man and the new woman each in his or her proper sphere. It was the challenging task of fascist educational systems to manufacture new men and women who were simultaneously fighters and obedient subjects. Educational systems in liberal states, alongside their mission to help individuals realize their intellectual potential, were already committed to shaping citizens. Fascist states were able to use existing educational personnel and structures with only a shift of emphasis toward sports and physical and military training. Some of the school's traditional functions were absorbed, to be sure, by party parallel organizations like the obligatory youth movements. All children in fascist states were supposed to be enrolled automatically in party organizations that structured their lives from childhood through university. Close to 70% of Italians aged 6 to 21 in the northern cities of Turin, Genoa, and Milan belonged to fascist youth organizations, though the proportion was much lower in the undeveloped South. Hitler was even more determined to take young Germans away from their traditional socializers, 
parents, school teachers, churches, and their traditional spontaneous amusements. Quote, these boys, unquote, he told the Reichstag on December 4th, 1938. Quote, join our organization at the age of 10 and get a breath of fresh air for the first time. Then, four years later, they move from the young Volk to the Hitler Youth, and there we keep them for another four years. And then we are even less prepared to give them back into the hands of those who create our class and status barriers. Rather, we take them immediately into the party, into the labor front, into the SA or the SS, and so on, unquote. Between the end of 1932 and the beginning of 1939, the Hitlerjugend expanded its share of the 10 to 18 age group from 1% to 87%. Once out in the world, the citizens of a fascist state found the regime watching over their leisure time activities as well. The Doppelovaro in Italy and the Kraft Deutschfreude in Germany. Indeed, fascist regimes tried to redraw so radically the boundaries between private and public that the private sphere almost disappeared. Robert Ley, head of the Nazi labor office, said that in the Nazi state, the only private individual was someone asleep. For some observers, this effort to have the public sphere swallow up the private sphere entirely is indeed the very essence of fascism. It is certainly a fundamental point on which fascist regimes differed most profoundly from authoritarian conservatism, and even more profoundly from classical liberalism. There was no room in this vision of obligatory national unity for either free-thinking persons or for independent, autonomous sub-communities. Churches, Freemasonry, class-based unions and syndicates, political parties, all were suspect as subtracting something from the national will. Here were grounds for infinite conflict with conservatives as well as the left. In pursuit of their mission to unify the community within an all-consuming public sphere, fascist regimes dissolved unions and socialist parties. This radical amputation of what had been normal worker representation encased as it was in a project of national fulfillment and managed economy alienated public opinion less than pure military or police repression, as in traditional dictatorships. And indeed, the fascists had some success in reconciling some workers to a world without unions or socialist parties, those for whom proletarian solidarity against capitalist bosses was willingly replaced by national identity against other peoples. Brooding about cultural degeneracy was so important a fascist issue that some authors have put it at the center Every fascist regime sought to control the national culture from the top to purify it of foreign influences and make it help carry the message of national unity and revival. Decoding the cultural message of fascist ceremonies, films, performances, and visual arts has today become the most active field of research on fascism. The reading of fascist stagecraft, however ingenious, should not mislead us into thinking that fascist regimes succeeded in establishing monolithic cultural homogeneity. Cultural life in fascist regimes remained a complex patchwork of official activities, spontaneous activities that the regimes tolerated, and even some illicit ones. 90% of the films produced under the Nazi regime were light entertainment without overt propaganda content. Not that it was innocent, of course. A few protected Jewish artists hung on remarkably late in Nazi Germany, and the openly homosexual actor and director Gustav Grundgens remained active to the end. In no domain did the proposals of early fascism differ more from what fascist regimes did in practice than in economic policy. This 
was the area where both fascist leaders conceded the most to their conservative allies. Indeed, most fascists, above all after they were in power, considered economic policy as only a means to achieving the more important fascist ends in unifying, energizing, and expanding the community. Economic policy tended to be driven by the need to prepare and wage war. Politics trumped economics. Much ink has been spilled over whether fascism represented an emergency form of capitalism, a mechanism devised by capitalists by which the fascist state, their agent, disciplined the workforce in a way no traditional dictatorship could do. Today it is quite clear that businessmen often objected to specific aspects of fascist economic policies, sometimes with success. But fascist economic policy responded to political priorities and not to economic rationale. Both Mussolini and Hitler tended to think that economics was amenable to a ruler's will. Mussolini returned to the gold standard and revalued the lira at 90 to the British pound in December 1927 for reasons of national prestige and over the objections of his own finance minister. Fascism was not the first choice of most businessmen, but most of them preferred it to the alternatives that seemed likely in the special conditions of 1922 and 1933. Socialism, or a dysfunctional market system. So they mostly acquiesced in the formation of a fascist regime and accommodated to its requirements of removing Jews from management and accepting onerous economic controls. In time, most German and Italian businessmen adapted well to working with fascist regimes, at least those gratified by the fruits of rearmament and labor discipline and the considerable role given to them in the economic management. Mussolini's famous corporatist economic organization in particular was run in practice by leading businessmen. Peter Hayes puts it succinctly, the Nazi regime and business had, quote, converging but not identical interests, unquote. Areas of agreement included disciplining workers, lucrative armaments contracts, and job creation stimuli. Important areas of conflict involved government economic controls, limits on trade, and the high cost of autarky the economic self-sufficiency by which the Nazis hoped to overcome the shortages that had lost Germany World War I. Autarky required costly substitutes, ersatz, for such previously imported products as oil and rubber. Economic controls damaged smaller companies and those not involved in rearmament. Limits on trade created problems for companies that had formerly derived important profits from exports. The great chemical combine IG Farben is an excellent example. Before 1933, Farben had prospered in international trade. After 1933, the company's directors adapted to the regime's autarky and learned to prosper mightily as the suppliers of German rearmament. The best example of the expense of import substitution was the Hermann Goering Werke, set up to make steel from the inferior ores and brown coal of Silesia. The steel manufacturers were forced to help finance this operation, to which they raised vigorous objections. The businessmen may not have gotten everything they wanted from the Nazi command economy, but they got far more than the Nazi party radicals did. In June 1933, Otto Wagner, an old fighter who had become head of the economic policy branch of the party and who took his national socialism seriously enough to want to replace the, quote, egoistic spirit of profit of the individual person with common striving in the interest of the community, unquote, seemed likely to become minister of the economy. Hermann Goering, the Nazi leader closest to business, skillfully eliminated Wagner by showing Hitler that Wagner had been campaigning within the Nazi leadership for this appointment. 
Hitler, enraged at the slightest encroachment on his authority to name ministers, expelled Wagner from the party and named to the post Dr. Kurt Schmidt, head of Allianz, Germany's biggest insurance company. Nazi economic radicalism did not disappear, however. Private insurance executives never stopped fighting attempts by Nazi radicals to replace them with nonprofit mutual funds organized within each economic sector, Volkisch Insurance. While the radicals found some niches for public insurance companies in SS enterprises in the conquered territories and in the labor front, the private insurers maneuvered so skillfully within a regime for which some of them felt distaste that they ended up with 85% of the business, including policies on Hitler's Berghof, Goering's Karrenhall, and slave labor factories in Auschwitz and elsewhere. Generally, economic radicals in the Nazi movement resigned, like Otto Strasser, or lost influence, like Wagner, or were murdered, like Gregor Strasser. Italian integral syndicalists either lost their influence, like Rossoni, or left the party, like Alceste de Ambris. In the short term, as liberal economies floundered in the early 1930s, fascist economies could look more capable than democracies of performing the harsh task of reconciling populations to diminished personal consumption in order to permit a higher rate of savings and investment, particularly in the military. But we know now that they never achieved the growth rates of post-war Europe, or even of pre-1914 Europe, or even the total mobilization for war achieved voluntarily and belatedly by some of the democracies. This makes it difficult to accept the definition of fascism as a, quote, developmental dictatorship, unquote, appropriate for latecomer industrial nations. Fascists did not wish to develop the economy, but to prepare for war, even though they needed accelerated arms production for that. Fascists had to do something about the welfare state. In Germany, the welfare experiments of the Weimar Republic had proved too expensive after the Depression struck in 1929. The Nazis trimmed them and perverted them by radical forms of exclusion, but neither fascist regime tried to dismantle the welfare state, as mere reactionaries might have done. Fascism was revolutionary in its radically new conceptions of citizenship, of the way individuals participated in the life of the community. It was counter-revolutionary, however, with respect to such traditional projects of the left as individual liberties, human rights, due process, and international peace. In sum, the fascist exercise of power involved a coalition composed of the same elements in Mussolini's Italy as in Nazi Germany. It was the relative weight among leader, party, and traditional institutions that distinguished one case from the other. In Italy, the traditional state wound up with supremacy over the party, largely because Mussolini feared his own most militant followers, the local Raz and their squadristi. In Nazi Germany, the party came to dominate the state and civil society, especially after war began. Fascist regimes functioned like an epoxy, an amalgam of two very different agents, fascist dynamism and conservative order. Bonded by shared enmity toward liberalism and the left, and a shared willingness to stop at nothing to destroy their common enemies. So ends Chapter 5 of Robert Paxton's uh, the Anatomy of Fascism. Uh, I'll briefly leave you with a couple of thoughts. Uh, this chapter reminds me of an article um, I read uh, where, you know, early into Trump's uh, political career, I can't remember if it was post-election or, or pre, uh, probably post, where they compared him to uh, Mussolini. They said he's, you should compare him to Mussolini, not Hitler, if you compare him to a fascist. And I see why, because... Uh, Trump keeps these state institutions uh, more or less intact and, uh, you know, uh, uses the already extant power of the state to uh, 
uh, exert his will without without bothering with with strong comparable parallel institutions because most institutions of the state already have fascist leanings, especially the police, the military, etc. Uh, the ones, the judiciary, the ones that he, you know, had uh, even a little bit of hand in shaping himself. Um, However, it, it struck me as odd, the description of Hitler as this indolent, you know, leader who didn't really want to do any work, and, you know, when people were with him, he would, you know, go on these long rants. I mean, that's very similar as well. So, you know, a lot of fun similarities there to uh, one of our most recent and most fascist presidents um, in America, that is, if you're listening outside of the country, uh, not your president. As always, I would like to extend a thank you to my patrons on Patreon. If you too would like to become a patron, you can visit my Patreon at patreon.com slash audioanarchy. Thank you to Moby Bongo, Jamie Suarez, Matthew Vergen, Jordan Peterson's Pharmacist, Michael Rudge, Darth Malik 135, Luna Diltz, Chris Kilbasa, Bilet, Bo Whitney, Jacob Jubeck, and Bonnie. Thank you all so much for your continued contribution to this channel. I really appreciate it. That's going to do it for me. Go ahead and get out there and seize the means of production, my little anarchist friends. <laughs>